the Centre for Research in Autism and Education's very special 8th Annual Lecture. And farewell to Professor Liz Pellicano. I'm Anna Remington. I'm a senior lecturer here at Cray, and I have the honour of taking over from Liz next month as Cray Director. I also have the pleasure of saying a few words about Liz this evening. It's no exaggeration to say that Liz is one of the best autism researchers in the world right now. She conducts cutting-edge scientific research with sensitivity and respect for all those involved in it and those who stand to benefit from it. There are so many ways in which Liz has influenced the UK autism research and the, all those who have had the pleasure of working alongside her. To do her justice, this introduction would need to be hours long. But given that we'd all rather hear from Liz herself, I'll keep it brief and share with you just three of these contributions, a small part of the lasting legacy that Liz will have here at Cray. These three span the many attributes, both personal and professional, that Liz has. First on the list, a scientific contribution, specifically her executive function research. Many of you here will be familiar with the marshmallow test. This is where children test out their powers of inhibition by trying to resist eating a marshmallow so that they can have two marshmallows later. Unbeknown to many, however, Liz has used a form of this test on her staff on a weekly basis. <laughs> At the Cray meetings, snacks are laid out, but only opened when the speaker has finished. <laughs> From October, we will sadly be eating all the way through the meetings. <laughs> Second in the list is a more personal trait. Liz has an elegance that is clear in her research, in the way she designs her experiments and the way she presents her findings. She also has a wonderful personal sense of style, which is why it's all the more surprising that her greatest impact in this area is not entirely positive. Liz played fashion designer to create a uniform for staff running Brain Detectives, our public engagement event for adolescents and children that we run several times a year. We eagerly awaited a sleek, sophisticated shirt. <laughs> no. <laughs> we all spent several weeks a year dressed in baby blue. Why? <laughs> The final area of impact we've chosen to mention this evening is Liz's mentoring skills. Liz excels at, as a mentor and makes everyone feel so supported and valued. However busy she is, she will always make time to celebrate the achievements of her colleagues and students. Her rule is that every paper accepted, grant success or PhD awarded is accompanied by champagne. I'd like to just show you the list of her achievements from 2017 and give her the details of Alcoholics Anonymous Australia. But on a more serious note, Liz is an inspiration to all of us. Her achievements speak for themselves, but there is so much more to Liz than an epic CV. She conducts her research with such integrity and rigour. Nothing is ever too much effort if it will make a project better. If a new finding or type of analysis comes to light, even moments before a completed manuscript is submitted, this will stop, consider the implications, and rework the whole project if necessary. While clearly passionate about her research, Liz cares just as deeply for those around her. She works tirelessly to support colleagues, autistic people, their families and supporters. She is generous with her time and advice and pushes us all to do a little more than we think we can, always with a warm smile and an infectious laugh. It's hard to put into words how much we will all miss you. The UK's loss is undoubtedly Australia's gain and we will make sure we hang on to you as a collaborator for many years to come. But 
but before we all get too depressed, let's get back to tonight. We're thrilled that Liz has agreed to give the 2017 Prey Annual Lecture. An educational psychologist by trade, Liz began her research career in Australia before moving over to the UK and working as a junior research fellow in Oxford, at the University of Oxford, and a lecturer at Bristol University. She joined Cray when it was founded in 2009, working as a senior lecturer, a reader, and then professor of autism research. Liz has won numerous awards for her research, including most recently the very prestigious Philip Leverhulme Prize, which recognises the achievements of outstanding researchers whose work has already attracted international recognition and whose future is exceptionally promising. This evening, Liz looks back at her years at the centre to investigate what the autistic community rightly demands of autism research and the major changes that will need to be made to deliver on their expectations. So tonight, for the final time, please welcome Cray Director, Professor Liz Pelicano. listening, 
learning and involving autistic people and their families in research. Truly knowing autism requires both objective and subjective understandings, experience and expertise. And that's my argument today. I want to draw on all the work that we've done at CREA in the last few years in order to try and convince even the most skeptical of you that scientific research needs to change if we're going to do what we claim to do and to properly learn about autism. So it's a complex task I've set myself for tonight. Um, so I'm going to try and keep the structure as clear as possible for my sake as much as yours. I want to start, so this is part one, by talking about the explosion of the scientific research that we've seen over the past decade in autism and ask where it's helped us. I'll make a case for the need for more applied research, which raises the question, in part two, um, whether there is still then a case for what we call basic science or, or, or lab-based um, lab or uh, less applied research. Of course, the answer will be yes, but perhaps not in the way that we expect. Then in part three, I want to make my own concrete argument. I'll outline three ways in which we actually know autism better than orthodox science might allow. And that's when our research goes from lab to community and back again. When community involvement challenges our perceptions and our misperceptions of the data we collect. And when we bring together experts and experts by experience. I'll conclude by suggesting that working together with community members in research, community members as scholars, as co-researchers, as advisors, as supporters, is necessary for truly knowing autism. Okay, so let me start in a place um, at which many of you will have heard me speak before, on the explosion of scientific research in the past decade, and the uses to which it has and has not been put. Now, this graph comes from an analysis of PubMed, which is a database that houses millions of publications um, in the biomedical literature. And I just did a rough search um, for the term autism, um, and I also did rough searches for the term ADHD, development of coordination disorder, or dyspraxia, and specific language impairment. And so you've got the number of publications on this axis, and you've got dates, time on, the, on this axis here. So from 1946, actually to 2016, that's the last century. Um, what I want you to focus on is the uh, dark pink line, which doesn't look so pink, but the one that goes up. <laughs> um, that's a case of autism publication. Um, and what I hope you can see is that when we hit the year around 2000, um, there are fewer than 500 publications on autism every year, and, and, and fewer than that in the, in the early years. And from then on, there's this exponential surge such that in 2016, which is the final entry, we have more than 3,500 publications on autism. And what I also hope you can see is that this growth far surpasses growth in other fervent areas like ADHD, um, which is the kind of second, um, the, the light level light. Um, and even, you know, and, and definitely surpasses. Um, the growth, there's a little bit of growth in, um, in DCD and SLI research, but not so much. Um, so there's a lot of research going on, there's a huge amount of research going on. So much so that it's prompted a lot of discussion, including by the anonymous blogger Neuroskeptic, who wrote a blog in 2013 headed, Are We Heading for Autism? Indeed, with all of this knowledge being produced on autism, one would think that all of this research should make a profound difference to people's lives. But it does it. Not necessarily. More scientific research does not automatically yield improvements in people's lives. And I think that's because of the choices that have been made regarding who, what gets researched and what doesn't. In 2010, I had the privilege of working on a project with Tony Charman we set out to look at just that. We looked at how much had been spent on autism research in the UK in the past five years and what it had been spent on. And we consulted with more than 1,700 autistic people, their family members, practitioners and researchers to understand what they thought of current autism research and where they thought the funds should be prioritised in the future. 
our report acknowledges you know, the many great strengths of autism research in the UK, stretching from the amazing and inspiring early work of Sir Michael Butter to the fruit of the campaign. But it also noted considerable challenges in the years to come. While autistic people and their family members were impressed by the quality of British autism research, they were not convinced that research, this research made a difference to their lives. So one woman said, you know, I fill in all these questionnaires and do everything I can to help, but when it comes down to it, it's not real life. It's always missing the next step. It's great you've done the research, you've listened to my views, but now do something with it. Too many people feel that there's a huge gap between knowledge and practice. Research doesn't seem to help the young autistic people learn to catch a bus by themselves or to keep themselves safe. And it doesn't say how to help autistic adults get themselves into a job and keep themselves there. Our participants want us to see real changes for themselves, their child, or the person with whom they work. They thought British academics were not taking enough notice of real life issues. And they were right. Our analysis showed that the majority of UK autism research focused heavily on what's called basic science, neural and cognitive systems, genetics, and other risk factors. Rather than on research targeting the immediate circumstances in which autistic people find themselves, on services, treatments, interventions, and education. In fact, our report showed that only 5% of research funding between 2007 and 2011 went towards identifying effective services for autistic people and their family. Only 5%. Autistic adults and parents of autistic children you know, said to us they valued the need for basic scientific research to understand better you know, autism's underlying causes because we simply don't know enough. But they wanted a more balanced profile, valuing research the direct impact on the daily lives of autistic people as well as researching the core areas of basic science. Not only did we find that research was lacking in these specific areas, we also showed that certain populations of individuals were being underserved. That's the adults, the older adults, and girls and women. Both the lack of research on real life issues and the lack of translation of existing research into practice um, you know, it generates very, very serious problems. <laughs> problems for those responsible for commissioning local autism services and problems for people working in those services, and problems for autistic individuals and their families as they attempt to make evidence-based decisions on education, health, and social care. Now, one plausible reason for this disconnect between um, what gets researched and what people want to be researched focuses on the decision-making processes around research. So research priorities are ordinarily set <coughs> almost exclusively by scientific funders and academics in specialist fields. Autistic people, their family members, and even practitioners are very rarely involved in the decision-making processes that shape research and its applications. They are rarely involved beyond being passive participants in subjects of research. And, 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 and as we know from our own work, that lack of involvement results in feelings of disenfranchisement. Indeed, in a focus group that I ran for this study, one autistic adult rather skeptically asked me, whatever we say, is it really going to influence people? That's a very sorry statement. Involving community members, so autistic people, their family members, and those who support them in research should be an essential part of what we do as autism researchers. It should make our research more relevant to people's everyday lives, more tailored to their individual needs, and more consistent with their values. Now, I've been talking about these findings, and this means the community involved in research all over the world, from the US to Denmark to Australia to Spain for the past five years. And I usually get a very positive response from them. It clearly resonates with people who are having similar experiences wherever you go. But I wouldn't be being honest if I didn't acknowledge that there has been a somewhat more critical response, including from people who 
standardised and migrating. So in preparing for this talk, I've been reflective on the counter-arguments, the reasons to be worried about community involvement in research, the people who don't agree, and why they don't agree. And in this second part of the talk, I'm going to tackle some of these challenges, including the preeminence of basic science. So most researchers, at least in our acute to make together research, were convinced, just like community members, that we need more applied research in areas of services, supports, interventions, and education. Very few people dispute that we need more research to enhance the well-being and lives of people and their families. There's no doubt about that. But many scientists have argued to me over the years that there should be a clear division of labour, with some researchers concerned with you know, service design, education and the like, but others who are concerned with so-called basic science. And people have said that my mistake has been to kind of mix up the two. So the hard scientists, the geneticists, the neuroscientists, the neurobiologists, the cognitive scientists, aren't trained to do that more applied research. So the other goes. And so need to be allowed to get on with doing that hard science, doing what they're actually expert in. And it goes further than that too. So some scientists are very wary about getting autistic people and their allies involved in different parts of the research, scientific research process. Scientific research, they remind me, is prized for being impartial, falsifiable, and rigorous. For some, the very involvement of people with a vested interest potentially introduces a bias into the scientific method. And for good reasons, people don't want to mess with that. They feel that the people making judgments about research or research funding have to be other scientists. That people with autism in their families may not be the appropriate person to decide where research funding should be allocated. And the involvement of people with autism in their families in dialogue about funding risks politicising a scientific issue. The last point is actually really in the news at the moment. So one potential problem or challenge with involving parents, autistic people and other stakeholders is that it implausibly places every participant on an equal footing. And the Vaccine Autism Cure is one example of the difficulties that result from such an approach. On the one hand, we've got scientific evidence that overwhelmingly suggests that vaccines do not cause autism. And on the other hand, we still have widespread doubt about vaccine safety, including from the President of the United States. <laughs> An increasing number of people seem to simply dismiss the advice of scientific experts on various topics, from vaccinations to climate change. And in the era of fake news and post-truth, it's not surprising that many scientists are not keen to share their research platforms with non-scientists, even from the um, autistic and um, autism communities. And just to reinforce this point, you may remember during the Brexit campaign before the referendum, when Michael Gove said, People in this country have had enough of experts. Here we have um, in the commentary box here, um, Nobel Prize winner, former president of the Royal Society, Sir Paul Nurse, commenting on Michael Gove's um, comments. Um, and he says, the fact that experts have been divided in this way does have an effect on undermining science and scientific evidence. So Paul said that the British public still has high levels of trust in scientists, but we are living in a period where opinion is on the front of those who are experts, who have the knowledge, who have the intellectual ability to dissect these difficult problems, are being derided and pushed back. Science is built to last. Opinion, opinions are not built to last. So scientists are resistant to involve, some scientists are resistant to involve our community members of research, particularly in basic hard science, are therefore understandable in the era of Donald Trump. Um, Brexit and the attack on truth. It's understandable that scientists want to protect the integrity of their work. And just as the surgeon shouldn't operate on their own child, you know, that autism and autistic communities shouldn't be trying to mess with the scientific method. Or so the case goes. So 
So on these arguments, one could say that we need to be more attentive to real life issues in autism research. We need to be doing more practical research because it is the right thing to do. It's the most ethical thing to do. We still need basic autism science because we need to know more about autism. But for this aspect of research, we need to be wary of community involvement for the very reasons I've described. So this is all very compelling, okay, you think. But it misses something. It misses something very important. Basic scientists are on a quest to understand autism, at whatever level at which they're operating. They're on a quest to know autism. And what I want to argue in the remainder of my talk is that it is not possible to know autism without the involvement of actually autistic people and their allies in whatever research we're doing. Scientific investigation and community involvement are not at odds with each other. They are vital components of the same thing. So we get to the third part of my talk. And here I'm going to outline three ways in which we can and will actually know autism effects. The first is about is getting research from the lab to the community and back again. Now this getting, getting research from the lab to the community is called translational research, in which the goal is to translate discoveries from basic science into benefits for human health in the real world. Um, taking research, as the medics say, from bench to bench time. It thus has a key role to play in improving our lives. But going in one direction, from lab to community, is not enough. In order to understand what's really going on, we also need to encourage backwards or reverse translation, with knowledge from the community stretching back into the lab. The translational pipeline that you see here shouldn't just go in one direction, it also needs to go in reverse. The idea here is that the initial research itself will be more successful when the researchers listen to and learn from autistic people and their allies in their own context. Just think about how the research agenda is set normally. Too often at the moment, it depends on the you know, scientists talking to other scientists, reading journal articles, writing funding bids, and identifying research questions that way. Think how much richer and more complex the research agenda might be if these researchers actually listen to autistic people, their family members, clinicians, educators. Those who aren't trained as scientists might at least occasionally spot issues that need investigation. And I'm going to give you an example from some research that we've recently done at Craig that illustrates how scientists might miss something worth investigating unless they listen in the way that I've described. And my example comes from uh, mental health or anxiety in autism. So we know that mental health problems are extremely common, which is particularly depression and anxiety. And scientists rightly want to know, in the case of anxiety, what causes anxiety in autistic people, and whether anxiety for autistic people differs from anxiety in normal. And in starting to examine this question, researchers were trying to distinguish between symptoms of anxiety similar to those seen in neurotypical adults, what people have called traditional anxiety, so everyday worries that are difficult to control or irritability, um, and what they call autism-specific signs of anxiety, or atypical anxiety, which is exacerbated and severe anxiety linked to the key features of autism. And in doing so, they presumed that the causes of anxiety must lie fundamentally with the person themselves, or with specific features of autism. Now some research I've done this year has made me think twice about investigating anxiety in autism in this way. And that's because I've had the privilege to be involved in the Know Your Normal project with Laura Crane, a fantastic group of young autistic adults and my voice volunteers, Fern Adams, Georgia Harper, and Jack Welch from Ambitious Scouts. They partnered with us on a, on a piece of genuinely co-produced research, 
such that Fern, George, or Jack were involved in the research at every step of the way, designing the questionnaire and interview questions, analyzing and interpreting the data, and helping to write up the report. And we sought the views of more than 100 young autistic adults aged between 16 and 25 years about how they felt about their mental health issues, how they identified whether they had mental health problems, and who they turned to for support. The results, and I urge you to read the report, are rather disheartening. With many young autistic people struggling to evaluate their own mental health effectively and struggling to identify the right kind of support where it is required. But what is important for the point I'm making here is that the way autistic people understood their own anxiety did not reflect the research agenda that the scientists had largely followed up to now. Autistic people, that is, did not tend to locate the root causes of their anxiety in autism itself. Rather, many suggested their anxiety emerged from the often hostile experience of other people's interactions with them. Which this quote, um, quote very clearly describes. This is young, one young um, adult who said, the reason that so many people with autism develop mental health conditions is because of the way we are treated. From early childhood, Autistic kids are excluded, frowned upon, and made to feel unnatural. We are constantly pressured to be more normal, whatever that means. I think that if someone who wasn't autistic grew up being excluded, bullied, and pressured to be something that they are not, they would very, less, very likely develop the same conditions. Um, the source of the, the anxiety for this and many other individuals lies with others. Others' perceptions, others' actions. If they're right, then it is precisely these experiences that we need to be learning from if we want to understand the nature of anxiety. So, if we want to shape an adequate research agenda when it comes to the question of mental health in autism, it's clearly best to start with the experiences of autistic people themselves. That's the first of my three ways to actually know autism better. By doing backwards translation, starting with the community, listening to and learning from autistic people and their allies at the beginning and throughout the research process. But the benefits of community engagement for scientific understanding of autism do not stop there. The second way to know autism is to have community involvement to challenge our perceptions or our misperceptions as we analyse the data that we collect and the research that we do. And here I've been very much inspired by the work of Michelle Dawson, who is an autistic scientist at the University of Montreal. It was Michelle who first pointed out that there are a whole host of research findings which find that autistic people are good at something, better than non autistic but they have tended to be presented by scientists as somehow revealing a problem. Data which in fact reveal strengths are often interpreted in a negative way, as a deficit or as an impairment. Here, Jean Laurent was on right. Autistics, like non-autistics, have genuine difficulties in many areas, and like non-autistics, require assistance in areas where they perform but autistics uniquely are seen as pathological when displaying significant or dramatic strengths, creating for autistics a nearly insurmountable disadvantage or disability not faced by non-autistics. So scientists are misinterpreting the data in front of them because they're not listening hard enough to autistic experience. And here's one example. And again, initially talked about by Michelle. Um, so these colleagues, Denko and um, et al, um, recorded children's laughter during a series of playful interactions with an experimenter. And when they, 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 they then went away and analysed the laughter acoustically, and they showed that autistic children used only one type of laughter, or they used real or voiced laughter. Whereas typical children exhibited two types of laughter, real or voiced laughter, and fake or unvoiced laughter. So an example of fake laughter is when you know, someone's telling you a joke and it's not really very funny, but you kind of feel like you have to go. Um, 
So it was a typical piece that should have worked really quickly. Um, and the authors concluded autistic children are not using laughter in a socially subtle manner, which actually contributes to the social deficits exhibited by children with autism instead of serving to facilitate connections with others. Now, I'm not necessarily knocking this study because actually I actually think it's a very neat piece of research. Um, but as Michelle points out, the way in which the apparent strength of autistic children, that they were genuine in their social response, was misdescribed as a result of their social deficits. It's actually deeply concerning. Laughing because you really think something is funny, rather than because you want someone to think you did, is presented as a problem. And that's a good thing. Now I'm going to give you one more example of misdescribing data because of failing to listen to autistic people. And this time this comes from my own work. So my colleagues and I were interested in what we call adaptation. Fundamental property of sensory assistance, which is basically a form of plasticity in which our current sensory experience is intimately affected by what we see around us. And over numerous experiments, we've shown that autistic children show less adaptation to sensory stimuli than neurotypical children. That is, they don't, they don't adapt or get used to stimuli as readily as neurotypical children, which I'm afraid I once described as abnormal adaptive mechanisms. Let me give you an example of an adaptation task so that you know what I mean. So this task measures number adaptation. Uh, so I don't get you to do this. It might not work in all cases. So bear with me. But what I want you to do is stare at the red dot for about 30 seconds. So that's what we're doing. Stare at the red dot. Watch the red dot. Different ways, we will make the kind of errors I described. 
And just to hammer home this point, there is even stronger arguments and evidence showing that we need autistic involvement because non-autistic people cannot understand their worlds as they do. And here is Jenny Milton, who has talked extensively about the social double entity problem, in which on the one hand we have the autistic people who reportedly have little, no theory of mind or empathy, um, and on the other hand, neurotypical people who, again, reportedly fully functioning a theory of mind or empathy. But what is problematic is that this apparently instinctive empathy of, autistic, of neurotypical people isn't necessarily applied when it comes to autistic which the earlier quote from the, one of the Know Your Normal participants clearly attests. And recent experimental research from both the UK and the US supports this position. Research has shown that neurotypical people um, find it difficult to read autistic people's expressions. <laughs> they find it difficult to, uh, to interpret the behaviour of autistic people. And they're less willing to interact with autistic people on the basis of their expressions. This work suggests a lack of alignment between the minds of autistic and non-autistic people. So it also suggests that autistic people might even be more adept than neurotypical people in reading the minds of those who are autistic, because they're better able to understand the different feelings, thoughts, and assumptions of those who are autistic. And supporting this is a wonderful quote from one of our autistic men in one of our recent studies who says, I can walk past a hundred people and I will see this one person and be like, yeah, that one person has autism. So that's a good advantage for me. If you have autism, you can have a really good understanding of other people with autism. All of this suggests that a fundamental problem in non-autistic researchers' quest to know autism and stresses the need for autistic involvement in that quest. So I've talked about two, um, uh, two of the three ways that we can actually know autism better, going from that to community and back again, and from ensuring that in community involvement in what it, uh, sorry, challenges our perceptions and our misperceptions of the data we have when we connect. The final way builds on this to suggest that we need to bring together what we might call expertise, sorry, experts, um, what we might call experts by experience. The great 18th century philosopher G.S.W. Hegel said that if we want to understand anything, we need to understand it both from the outside and from the inside. So if you want to know what London is, for example, it's good to look at it from a distance, maybe from an aerial photograph. But it's also good to experience, direct, experience it directly or to talk to those people who do, the people who take the tune every day people who jostle up and down Oxford Street, who put up with the rain, who complain about the rain. And the same goes for autism. If you want to try and get as close as we can to an understanding of autism, we need to try to grasp the crucial, crucial subjective experiences of autism, the particularities of autism, as well as the objective scientific facts. And here's the third reason. Um, that, sorry, that's the third reason why if we care about understanding autism, then we must involve those with experiential expertise in research. This means that we actually need to appreciate different people's experience um, based expertise. So scientists' knowledge is represented by empirical observation, theoretical argumentation, and ultimately objective truth. Parents have unique experience about the past development, the kind of support they might need, and actually autistic people might have direct experience of what it's like to be autistic and how they negotiate their everyday lives. Each of these communities therefore has what Collins and Evans have described or called experience-based experiences. Now this might seem really obvious, but it's still so rare studies of autism to combine these two elements. But let me show you what happens in the community. I want to take an example of this from my own work, along the term of outcome study. 
so you know, it's well known that you know, from, the, from the few longitudinal studies that, that have been done, they have repeatedly shown that the long-term outcomes of autistic adults are rather bleak. Few people have jobs, few live independently, and few have rich social networks. <coughs> Yet these studies have almost, almost exclusively focused on neurotypical defined norms of what a good outcome is for an autistic person, and they've almost entirely deployed methods that are good for testing objective psychological factors that very poor at actually discovering how autistic people are experiencing their own lives. I started off doing my longitudinal study in the standard way. My research published back in 2010 focused entirely on what I detected from my analysis of a batch of psychological tasks and included not one word of reflection from the autistic participants themselves or their parents. So this time round, and many years later, I've looked at both objective and subjective experiences. There are many findings from this study that have completely blown me away. But one in particular is that our young autistic adults tell me that they value deep <coughs> and sustainable relationships and connections with others in a way that I couldn't simply detect from the experimental tasks alone. They very clearly articulated their desire for quality, not quantity, friendships with family members and friends. So in terms of family members, they said, you know, my parents have been unbelievably supportive. I always ask my sister for advice. My grandmother was probably my most important teacher. They value those friendships even when they found it sorry, difficult to maintain friendships. So one person says, you know, my closer friends, I feel they definitely understand me. Another said, you know, I'm sad about leaving school because I may never see my friends I've made over the years. And another young person said, I'm worried about them just forgetting about me. Indeed, according to several young people, they find it difficult to maintain friendships with their neurotypical peers because unlike them, they were not interested in sex, drugs and party. But having fewer friends did not mean that they did not value those connections. It just meant that they had smaller social networks, closer friendships, um, as they report, and relied more on the emotional support from their family. Again, these findings might seem really obvious to the non-researchers in the room, but these data, this subjective knowledge, flies in the face of many current conceptions of autism that are popular in scientific circles, which suggest at the, at, the, at the most extreme, that autistic people are striving for lives of their isolation. <laughs> and evidence of these connections is not just seen in more cognitively able or intellectually able individuals. We have the same results um, when we looked at the experiences of autistic children and young people living in residential special schools in England, many of whom had additional intellectual difficulties and limited spoken, very limited spoken communication. Both their parents and the staff supporting them highlighted how much they valued stable, trusting relationships, just like any child. So one um, uh, parent says, you know, there's, 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 there's certain staff who's been really bonded with over the years. He's a key worker now, she's been with him since he started, and they've got a fantastic bond between the two of them. Another parent described the effects, the implications of being with these bonds can have. Um, particularly when there's a change in the support worker. So she was describing that this change for her son, he's gone downhill. He came home not speaking or withdrawn, not the happy go lucky boy that I'd seen previously. And some also noted um, that they, you know, in discovering focus groups, you know, that's why they sometimes felt like proud parents when the young people want, want you to be part of their lives. When they come and share their little moments with you, their sad moments, and they're happy Autistic people want to feel valued. They want deep and trusting relationships with others. The subjective, the subjective data from you know, these studies isn't just helpful knowledge. It's fundamental to our understanding of what autism is. It challenges core and objective beliefs about what autism is. So, 
those are the three ways in, think, in which I think we can actually know autism better. Understanding or knowing autism must combine orthodox scientific endeavour with three new efforts to reach beyond standard boundaries. Moving from lab to community, crucially that began. Always challenging our perceptions or our misperceptions of the data we collect. And constantly listening to and learning from experts by experience. So this evening I've made an argument. I suggested that involving autistic people and their allies in research is important not just because it's the right thing to do, but because their subjective understanding, their experiential expertise is necessary for knowing autism. We can't just know autism in the abstract in terms of scientific theory, data, textbook descriptions. We must also know it in particular, the reality of people's lives. The fundamental underpinnings of this argument aren't, of course, new. You can go all the way back to the ancient Greeks and all of it. Um, so since the dawn of reflections on science, people have been talking about this distinction between the general, the universal, the abstract, the objective, on the one hand, and the particular, the subjective, the everyday, on the other. Both of which are essential for the quest for the truth. Aristotle talked about phronesis, practical wisdom, those pieces of knowledge that are uncodifiable because they're so deeply connected to the particular, the everyday reality, rather than the general and the more abstract. And scholars, especially here at the IOE, have been making similar arguments in other domains for many of the last decades. But when talking about autism, we've largely missed out. But not for much longer. Because the case I've made tonight is increasingly shared across the world. There are some exciting changes afoot in autism science. We've been seeing some amazing activism from autistic sub advocates in the, in the UK and in the US who are making their voices heard. The most recent one that I'm particularly pleased about has been to get the journal Autism, which I'm an editor, to change their branding by getting rid of the puzzle piece. That's fantastic. We've also been working with autistic and neurotypical scholars and artists to put together a starter pack for doing participatory autism search, available freely for download for any of those keen to get started. Damien Milton and others have set up the Participatory Autism Research Collective, or PARC, to bring, to bring autistic people, including scholars and activists, together with early career researchers and practitioners who work with autistic people. They're aiming to build a community network where those who wish to see more significant involvement of autistic people in autism research can share
and their triumphs. Like Jay here, which is the little boy I worked with all those years ago, now all grown up, state basketball player, finishing school and moving on up into adulthood. As I now leave London to move back to Australia, I know those conversations I will remember, and I hope it's those lessons that I've learned.